Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another Peak Prosperity Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Martinson, and today we are fortunate to have Gavin Anderson with us as our guest. Gavin is the chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation, where he serves as the lead developer for its digital currency project. Today, we're going to talk about the rationale for alternative currencies, the benefits of a digital currency system, of course, but then I really want to dig into the advantages and challenges offered by Bitcoin. All right, Gavin, the rise of Bitcoin has generated a lot of interest among the Peak Prosperity audience, so we are really pleased that you've agreed to join us today and help us better understand how this new digital currency works. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Well, fantastic. So, Gavin, uh, in your opinion, why is there a need for alternative forms of currency to existing fiat money systems? I mean, you've made this your life. You're pouring a lot of your effort into it. Uh, what draws you to this? Well, I was first attracted to the Bitcoin project, um, partly because I'm a computer geek, so mm -hmm. I write software for a living, and it's very interesting software, partly because I've been interested in economics for a while, and the economic model behind Bitcoin really appealed to me. Um, and then also, uh, just because I've been interested in peer-to-peer -peer decentralized technologies, so technologies where there's no one person, company, government, in control. And Bitcoin combines all of those things together into a system that's, I think, really exciting. Well, let's talk about this system. Uh, for a lot of people, I, Bitcoin's a word, but it's not yet a developed concept. So uh, explain to us, if you could, how does the Bitcoin model work and what makes it unique over any other form of digital currency that might exist? Sure. Bitcoin's really a, a new kind of money. It's a new concept in how you can do money and that it's a virtual or digital currency that isn't issued by a central bank. It isn't created by some central corporation. Instead, everybody who's participating in the, the Bitcoin network, so everybody who's running the Bitcoin software on their computer and communicating over the network with other people who are running the Bitcoin software, all of those people together collectively perform the functions that a central bank would typically perform. So those people all create the currency, those people all make sure that the transactions that happen are valid and the invalid transactions are rejected. Um, and so collectively, together, you know, everybody who's running the Bitcoin software makes the system work. And that makes it very resilient, really. It's resistant to central control, it's resistant to manipulating the money supply, it's resistant to censorship, it's resistant to a lot of other bad things that happen with our traditional fiat currencies. So I'm really fascinated in this. Tell me how, how a Bitcoin comes into being. You're, you're talking about uh, a self-regulating environment, and I'm interested in, in, like, actually, how does this work? Sure. Yeah, well, I could, I could talk technically for hours, but I'll try to keep it not so technical and geeky. Excellent. But basically, there are people who are running what are called, uh, what's called Bitcoin mining software, where actually these days there's actually Bitcoin mining hardware. Oh, really? Where these people are looking, uh, connected to the Bitcoin network, seeing all of the transactions that are flying by. They gather up these transactions into what are called blocks, so blocks of valid transactions. And then they run an algorithm that is designed to be very difficult to solve, but very easy to check to make sure your solution is correct. So all of these Bitcoin miners are busy running these checks to make sure all the transactions are valid. And then they're running this, this special algorithm that is basically a, a busy work, make work algorithm that's just designed so that it takes a while for somebody on the network to what's called solving a block, to, to find that magic number that makes the block have certain mathematical properties. And then once somebody on the network finds a block, they announce it as this is a valid set of transactions, um, and everybody else on the network checks it. Now, you might ask, well, why the heck would somebody do all this work of you know, validating transactions and finding these blocks of transactions? And the answer is, is very clever. The answer is that the very first transaction in every one of these blocks of transactions is a special transaction that creates bitcoins out of thin air. And so all of these Bitcoin miners 
are trying to find blocks because they will own that first transaction. They will own the Bitcoins that come out of that very first transaction that just creates Bitcoins. So right now, on the Bitcoin network, we're creating 25 new Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And when I say we, I mean you know, the Bitcoin miners who are doing this work, uh, who are all competing against each other to, be, to try to be the, the, the first person on the network that solves the block and announces it to the world and is therefore rewarded with 25 brand new Bitcoins. So that's, and that's the only way Bitcoins are created. So they're created in this way. What limits the creation of them, if anything? The, the creation is, is strictly limited by kind of rules written in the software. So if a Bitcoin miner decided to modify their software and say, I don't want more than 25 Bitcoins, I'm going to generate myself 100 Bitcoins every time I find a block, or I'm going to find a block quicker than everybody else, then, you know, everybody on the network checks all of the transactions and they would see that that transaction didn't follow the rules written into their software and they would reject their block. So it's, again, it's, you know, since everybody is running software that implements the same rules, you get these rules essentially set in stone. I mean, you'd have to convince everybody to upgrade their software to have different rules to, you know, change that aspect of the system. And but as long as as long as the the mining is happening and the, and the blocks are being solved, bitcoins are going to be created, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and transactions get verified. I mean, that's really the you know the the number one reason for miners to do their work is to you know, make sure that the transactions are verified. Somebody has to do the, the the work of making sure that bitcoins aren't spent twice. That that you know all of the transactions are valid and that were created in valid blocks and and so on and so forth. All right, so talk about these transactions uh, that happen, uh, that get collected in these blocks. What are these transactions? The, the transactions are basically, you know, one person paying another or one entity paying another. So, you know, if I send you some Bitcoins, then we would generate, let's say I sent you uh, half a Bitcoin. I would generate a, a Bitcoin transaction that, you know, reassigns Bitcoins that I own from me to you. And mm-hmm. then that transaction is broadcast over the network and then it's gathered up into a block by a miner, and that's when it becomes what we call confirmed. Um, because until a Bitcoin is put into a block and confirmed, you know, there's no guarantee that I might have sent you half a Bitcoin, but I could have at the same time tried to be sneaky and send somebody else that same half a Bitcoin. Right. So miners are doing this important work of you know, confirming that you know, yes, the transaction is valid, and this is going to be the history, and everybody is going to agree that I sent that half a Bitcoin to you and not to somebody else. Okay, got that. So mining is one way to obtain Bitcoins. What's the other way? Well, I mean, like any other money, you can trade them for products or services. Uh, or, well, for example, uh, my salary is paid in Bitcoin. Hmm. So every month, I instead of you know getting a money deposited into my U.S. dollar bank account, uh, I get bitcoins sent to one of my Bitcoin addresses, and that's how my salary is paid. Okay, interesting. So, uh, how successful has Bitcoin adoption been so far? Uh, where, where, where is it? Where is it actively being traded in the world right now? We're still really at the early adopter phase, and mm-hmm. we have been since since Bitcoin started. So, I mean, adoption is actually happening pretty quickly uh, right now. All of the bitcoins in the world are worth somewhere over a billion dollars. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of scale for kind of how big the Bitcoin economy is. Um, Bitcoin actually, it turns out, last year I was doing some research and I was looking at, you know, how big is Bitcoin relative to some of the smaller national fiat currencies? Because I assumed that, you know, Bitcoin was probably smaller than any other national currency. And to my surprise, I actually found out that there are some small nations where the national currency is worth less than Bitcoin. Hmm. So all of the Bitcoins in the world are worth more than... It's up to now something like uh, a couple dozen you know, national currencies in, in smaller countries around the world. Uh, Bitcoin is actually a larger... has more value and is a larger economy than, than those small nations. So really adoption has, has really exploded and is really taking off, which is fantastic. In this adoption, have you noticed any patterns in terms of uh, different cultures, regions of the world, countries that have, have really fallen for it compared to others? 
Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, there's a big, uh, well, a big. There's a small, big, there's a small Bitcoin community in a town in Germany, actually, which is interesting. And I think that we will probably see Bitcoin taking off in places where either people remember their national currency being incredibly unstable. So I think a lot of people in Germany still remember the hyperinflation that happened after uh, World War I. Mm -hmm. And so a system like Bitcoin that cannot be hyperinflated away really appeals to them. And I think we'll see that in other places around the world where you know the national currency hasn't been particularly stable. I think here in the United States, I mean, there's a lot of interest, and we're a really big country, so there are a lot, are a lot of Bitcoin users here in the United States. But I don't think Bitcoin will go mainstream first here, just because I mean, the dollar has been such a, well, it's been a relatively stable fiat currency compared to a lot of other nation, national currencies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've certainly heard, I, gosh, where was it? Kenya? I was hearing of somewhere in Africa where, where they, they just splashed across the news where the Bitcoins apparently are very popular there as well. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it, there's so many things happening in the Bitcoin world that even I have trouble keeping track of all of the great things that are happening all over the world. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, what the challenges might be to uh, this widespread adoption. So we, we've heard maybe Germany is, is open to the idea potentially because of uh, prior history with, with money systems. Uh, what what are the blockages that you see uh, that that might exist for uh, adoption in countries right now? Sure. Well, there's some technical issues just in terms of how easy it is to use Bitcoin software, how easy mm -hmm. it is to keep your Bitcoin safe. You know, I still tell people that Bitcoin is you know, like a like a high tech internet stock. So you know, it's a risky investment, and unless you're technically savvy, it's you know, somewhat risky to hold bitcoins. You know, a lot of people have had bitcoin stolen because their computers were insecure and things like that. And and I'm actually really optimistic that that will get fixed fairly shortly. You know, in the next year or two, I think it will be much easier to hold bitcoins securely. It will be much easier to trade them, um, and it will really be much easier for kind of mainstream, you know, non-geek people to to use the system. So. That is happening. There's one big caveat to that, and that's the other big challenge that I see, and, and that is how governments will react to mm. Bitcoin. Yeah. And will governments decide to try to either regulate Bitcoin or you know, prevent people from using Bitcoin? Uh, and that's a big open question. So you know, here in the United States, it looks like you know, the regulators are open to Bitcoin. And you know, I'm the chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation, and one of the missions of the foundation is to help protect Bitcoin. And part of that is you know, interacting with regulators and trying to educate them on you know, what is Bitcoin, how could it be regulated, how should it be regulated, uh, you know, those kinds of issues. And so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, about all of that, although there are a lot of uh, um, onerous laws and regulations around handling money. And so I think it remains to be seen, you know, kind of how things evolve there, certainly here in the United States and then also around the world. I mean, I, there, there won't be just one answer because you know, each country has its own laws and regulations regarding what citizens can do with their money. Oh, sure. Uh, and uh, it's actually one of the, the more potent areas to find uh, regulation and, and uh, lots of oversight. Certainly, I've been reading about what appear to me to be uh, early salvos at containing Bitcoin or otherwise getting regulatory arms around it uh, within the U.S., other places, other countries, uh, looking to define it as something that really needs to be looked at. And, you know, I've, I've, it's, it seems to me from this, this vantage point that, that uh, Bitcoin is getting, um, has gotten the attention of authorities in various countries and that they are, I don't know that they're necessarily unified against it or for it yet, but, but they're certainly starting to wrestle with, with what it means. And uh, what's your sense of, of where you are in that part of the story right now? I, again, I still think we're at the kind of early adopter phase, even in terms of regulation and regulators and how will regulators deal with it. You know, which pigeonhole will they put it in? And then, of course, I mean, it's interesting because you, know, you have regulators who are tasked with the unenviable task of trying to figure out how new things fit into existing laws when you know these laws were written 
before the internet, before there was even the concept of you know peer-to-peer technologies, or you know, or let alone a, a, a peer-to-peer money. So it's 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 a big challenge for regulators, and I actually empathize with the difficulty of their task because Bitcoin is something brand new, and really there aren't any laws that exactly match it. Um, mm-hmm. So part of it will be regulators trying to figure out you know, how does it fit into an existing framework. And then, of course, you know, lawmakers will probably at some point get involved and start to write some new laws or modify existing laws to take into account you know, this new technology. So we see exactly the same thing on the Internet with you know, arguments about copyright and you know, is a link to content are there any rights involved in linking to content and deep linking? And there, there are lots of other. You, when, whenever there's a new technology, you know, the legal system has to catch up. So we will see. I mean, it's still playing out. It's still early. And again, I don't think there'll be one answer. I think there will be different answers in different countries around the world. I think some countries will probably be much more open to you know letting people transact with each other freely using whatever currency they want to. And others will be, you know, much more strict and want to want to control how their citizens spend their money. And how about the taxing authorities so far? I assume those they would be one of the more, if not the most, interested party in in any of uh, these uh, discussions you're talking about. Well, it's been interesting. I mean, the the IRS has not made any rulings on Bitcoin yet, although. I believe that it was the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which is another arm of the U.S. government. I think they had a memo saying that the IRS should come out with some guidance on you know, how to treat bitcoins. I mean, I think everybody, everybody I've heard from thinks that it's pretty clear and that bitcoins will be, bitcoin transactions will be treated just like barter transactions. So you know. If you sell something for Bitcoin, then you owe sales tax on it, just as if you had traded something for a barter credit. Or, you know, there's there's existing regulations and laws around barter transactions that will that apply if if you are you know trading anything for anything else of, of value. So I think I think that will actually be pretty straightforward, at least here in the United States. Other countries might be different again. All right. Well, let's let's go back to something that, that you you touched on briefly. I want to ask the question: How secure is Bitcoin? And to frame that, what's your answer to this question? Could I lose all my money at the click of a button, or if a server crashed? Well, I'll give you a two part answer. I mean, the, the the core Bitcoin system is incredibly secure. There's a a company called BitPay that provides merchant services to all sorts of companies that are selling products for Bitcoin. And BitPay has never had a fraudulent transaction. So, you know, unlike paying for things online with credit cards where, you know, there's all sorts of credit card fraud and, and other things like that happening, the core Bitcoin system is incredibly secure. And, you know, you don't have to worry about kind of somebody spending your Bitcoins out from under you because they somehow hacked the Bitcoin system. Bitcoin has been looked at by security experts, and everybody is is convinced that the kind of underlying system is technically secure. Now that said, Bitcoin is also like cash. So if you own some Bitcoins and you're holding some Bitcoins in your digital wallet, then that's like holding you know physical cash in your physical wallet. In that, if somebody steals that wallet, then they've got your Bitcoins. Hmm. So there have been a lot of Bitcoin thefts because people either lost their wallet and their wallet was not protected by a password, or they lost their wallet and they're using a weak password to protect their wallet, um, or you know maybe some virus or malware got into their computer and uh, installed what's called a keylogger and managed to get both their wallet and their password because there was you know bad software running on the computer watching them type their password as they typed it. So yeah, that's why I say Bitcoin security is not a solved problem yet. We really need to make it much easier for people to have a really secure Bitcoin wallet so it is much harder to lose your Bitcoins to, to, to hackers. Now, you, don't, you, you, know, you said, will I lose all of my money if a server crashes? That's not an issue. Uh, I mean, like I said, all of the, the you know, there are tens of thousands of Bitcoin miners 
looking for Bitcoin, and they actually hold a record of all the transactions that have happened on the Bitcoin network. So you know, there's no one single server that can crash and take all your Bitcoins away. It's, it's very distributed and you know, reliable in that way. But, but again, you, know, you are responsible for holding your what are called your private keys. Those are what let you spend your Bitcoins. And if you lose your private keys either to a, an, a hacker, an attacker, or if you just if your computer crashes and you didn't have a backup of your keys, then you can lose your Bitcoin. And what would be some of the potential answers to to giving people a, a, a very a more secure wallet, but that, that's also not onerously difficult to operate? Well, I mean, we can look at the traditional banking system for some potential solutions, and and the the, the core Bitcoin network has lots of tricks up its sleeve. <laughs> so there, there are some features built into kind of the core protocol that we haven't evolved the software to expose to users yet. So you know, the technical work that I've actually been working really hard on involves transaction where the transactions where more than one key is needed to, to spend those Bitcoins. So you can have Bitcoins protected by two keys, and then one key is kept on your computer, and then one key is kept somewhere else. And so whenever you spend Bitcoins, the transaction will have to be authorized on your computer and then at that other place also, which could be your mobile phone. It might be some service that, you know, provides some, you know, verification and checking. Uh, you can imagine a service where, you know, they only authorize, they automatically authorize transactions under a certain amount per day. So, you know, if you have $100,000 worth of Bitcoins, you know, maybe you set up a, a wallet where you're only able to spend up to $1,000 per day, and anything l larger than that requires some kind of manual, you know, call them up, prove who you are to make the transaction go through. So all of that kind of thing can be built and will be built, but it's going to take some time. Oh, I should also mention, there are actually also people working on hardware Bitcoin wallets. So these are actually physical pieces of hardware that can store your Bitcoins and perform Bitcoin transactions. And so I think for a lot of people, that may be a much more secure way of you know, holding Bitcoins and performing Bitcoin transactions, just because if you have a dedicated piece of hardware that does nothing but Bitcoin, it can be made you know, much more secure than a, a general piece of hardware like your computer or your cell phone, where you know, uh, if you're running other software, that's a potential for for attackers to, to get in and, and put malware on your system that tries to steal your Bitcoins. Well, if we ever lost our Bitcoins, the NSA would be able to tell us where they were, wouldn't they? <laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is, I mean, the, the, you know, every, every Bitcoin transaction that sends you Bitcoins is public record, right? All of the yep. miners are watching them. Yep. And so, you know, we know where they are. Everybody knows where they are. Yep. It's just you can't get them out unless you have that private key that... Right. Only you know, and even the NSA, you, you you can arrange things to be you know very sure that even the NSA does not know that private key. You can actually generate Bitcoin public private key pairs completely offline from any computer. So there are paranoid people who you know they they, they create what's called a uh, paper wallet where they take a computer, you know, brand new computer, it's never been used for anything else. They generate some Bitcoin addresses, Bitcoin key pairs. And they print out the private keys on pieces of paper, put them someplace safe, destroy the computer so that you know, there's no possibility that those private keys will ever be anywhere other than those pieces of paper. Uh, and then you can send bitcoins to the public keys associated with those private keys and have basically bitcoins stored on paper, which you can then put in your safe deposit vault or some other place safe. And you know that's an example of that, that's that's being ultra paranoid, but maybe in this era of NSA surveillance, <laughs> maybe that's not too paranoid to you know make sure that nobody knows your your private keys and nobody but you can spend your bitcoins. Well, it's not just the NSA. It might be uh, we're concerned about Cyprus or um, any other parts of the system. It sounds like a way to to take your wealth and have it it both it's floating around in the virtual world right but you have a physical manifestation of it that's out of the system so it's kind of a hybrid um it's in the system but the access to it is completely out of the system so that's yeah it is i mean yeah it's an interesting another hybrid. variation that, that that's kind of mind-blowing that's the notion of a, a brain wallet where you can if you can think up some like long passphrase that you can remember but nobody else will be able to guess 
then essentially you can send bitcoins to that passphrase. And it doesn't even need to be written down anywhere. It could just be in your brain. And then, you know, you're essentially carrying around those bitcoins in your brain because only you know the key to unlock them. Ah. So it, it gets very, you know, I mean, the, all the old-fashioned notions of, you know, for example, governments trying to control the flow of currency across their borders, you know, with Bitcoin, where all of the Bitcoins basically live in this cloud that's all over the world, and where the keys to unlock the Bitcoins can be on pieces of paper, can even be just entirely in your brain, I mean, you know, it, it opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities, and certainly gives you a lot more freedom in, in control over your wealth. Uh, that is fascinating. Um... So I have a question from from a, a, a reader at the site, Jim H., and he, and he wrote, uh, in March, the Bitcoin network experienced a minor catastrophe when the blockchain broke off into two divergent versions due to an unanticipated glitch in a new version of the mining software that some were running. I found it confidence-inspiring to see the community quickly come together and back out of the update, but it begs the question, have any actions been taken to provide more thorough QA on subsequent software updates such that we can expect less chance of future confidence-shaking events like this. I see that as two parts. First of all, can you explain what he's talking about when he says uh, a blockchain broke off into divergent versions and then um, around the QA question? Sure. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a stressful night for me. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, so we have all of these miners all over the world validating transactions and you know validating these blocks of transactions that happen. And on that, day in March, it just so happened that we had rolled out a, a new version of the software that had a, a bug in it that we didn't, or actually I should, I should say the, the old version of the software had a bug in it that we weren't aware of that the new version fixed. Hmm. Um, and the problem was we had about half of the miners running the old version and half of the miners were running the new version. And they disagreed about whether a block was valid. And so half of them rejected that block and the transactions in it, and the other half accepted it mm. and, and continued going. Now, it turns out that the miners had had upgraded their software more quickly than most of the merchants and other people accepting Bitcoins. So most of the, most of the, the merchants and people who accept Bitcoins were accepting the, the, the old version of history, the old uh, you know, transaction chain. We realized this, and some of the, the big miners decided to basically give up their blocks and, and switch to the other version of transaction history. And so that resolved the issue and uh, let's see, it was 26 blocks, a block every 10 minutes. So, you know, after five or six hours, you know, everything was good again and everybody agreed about what the, what the valid transactions were. Mm -hmm. um, and so that conflict got resolved. And it was really... The question asks about, you know, what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again in the future? And I actually, or, or I, I, uh, I should say, me and the other core developers wrote up a, a document, on a, a post-mortem document on, you know, what happened and what we can do to not make sure it doesn't happen again because it theoretically could happen again. Uh, but if it does happen, you know, how can we react quickly? How can we make sure it doesn't have, you know, large consequences for anybody? And so, you know, we do have a plan for kind of mitigating that risk. And I should say also, I mean, one of the things that will really help make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen in the future is to get more diversity of software running on the Bitcoin network. So we're seeing, you know, we, we have this original software that was, that was written that basically everybody's been using, uh, but people have been re-implementing Bitcoin in different programming languages, you know, with different, because they, for whatever reason, maybe maybe they don't like the style of the code that was written, but there are new implementations of Bitcoin that follow exactly the same rules, but are just written differently. And one of the nice things about that is once those come online, you, we won't get into a situation where half of the network has a bug and the other half of the network doesn't have a bug. It will be, you know, maybe 10% of the network uh, has a bug that rejects some block. Um, the other 90% of the network will agree. 
And as long as you don't get that, you know, close to 50-50 situation, then this won't happen. So I think just the as Bitcoin evolves and grows and we get more diversity in terms of Bitcoin software running on the network, uh, that situation becomes less likely to happen, um, which is a very good thing. All right. So final question here. Do you see... Is Bitcoin the answer, or uh, do you see it as as a part of a larger portfolio of competing alternative currencies? Um, you know, you've got gold and silver, airline miles, um, you know, whatever whatever those other things are that we attach value to. How do you see uh, Bitcoin fitting into uh, this uh, universe? I think Bitcoin will be an answer. I, you know, I still tell people only invest time or money in Bitcoin that you can afford to lose because it is early adopter stage. It is still, I would consider it, a high-risk investment if you wanted to give it as an investment. It could be really huge. I I think there's no theoretical reason why Bitcoin couldn't grow as large as, you know, some of the major national currencies. There's no really technical reason why it couldn't and no theoretical reason why it couldn't. There's a huge network effect with money. So the more people using a means of exchange, the more valuable it becomes to use that thing as a means of exchange. And that's why gold is kind of king uh, and not platinum or silver. It's just there's been a huge network effect in people finding gold to be a you know great store of value and in certain situations uh, you know, good means of exchange. So you know, Bitcoin has a huge head start on you know, any other alternative. So the so some other alternative for some other you know, cryptocurrency alternative to overtake Bitcoin at this point, I think it would have to be a whole lot better in some way. And it's hard for me to imagine, you know, how do you make it so much better that people want to use that other thing rather than Bitcoin? I mean, I can imagine a few things that might make it somewhat uh, a whole lot better, like you know, if some major government decided to issue a Bitcoin-like currency, that would certainly give that currency a lot of legitimacy. Um, you know, that could compete with Bitcoin. Although I don't, it, it's hard for me to imagine a, a government being forward-looking enough to do that. Um, but you know, we'll see. It's 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 going to be fun to watch. Bitcoin has certainly grown a whole lot faster than I expected it would, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that it will keep on growing. All right, so let's pretend I'm I'm uh, brand new. I want to buy a Bitcoin instead of mine one. How would I go about doing that? Right now, the easiest way to buy Bitcoins is probably to sign up for a Coinbase account. There's a company called Coinbase.com here in the United States. They let you attach, basically attach your Bitcoin wallet to your bank account, and then you can very easily buy and sell Bitcoins directly via transfers to and from your bank account. So that's probably the easiest way. Uh, there's also a, if you want to be more anonymous or you don't have a bank account or you don't trust the banking system or you don't trust Coinbase, then there's actually a, a useful website called localbitcoins.com where you can find people buying or selling Bitcoins in a geographic area near you and you could you know, physically meet somebody and hand over some cash and they will send Bitcoins to your digital wallet. So... If you go to the uh, Bitcoin.org homepage, that's actually been recently redesigned to try to be more new person friendly. So there's there's lots of information there about getting a Bitcoin wallet and uh, getting Bitcoins in all sorts of different countries all over the world. Because again, you know, it really depends on on where you are in the world as to what the easiest way is to to get Bitcoins. All right, so last, last question. You get paid in Bitcoins. How do you spend them? Well, some of them, uh, I'll be perfectly honest, I can't pay my mortgage in Bitcoin yet. Mm-hmm. So some of them I convert into dollars and spend them that way. Then I'm always looking for products or services I can buy for Bitcoin. So, you know, there's a there's a big electronic store that will accept Bitcoins for you know, when I need a new hard drive or when I need a new monitor or whatever. Uh, I buy my most recent purchase, I bought some T-shirts for Bitcoin. Hmm. There's a website where you can buy plane tickets for Bitcoin, although I actually, actually haven't actually used them yet because they're pretty new. Um, but there's more and more products and services available for Bitcoin 
all the time. You know, I'm a computer geek, so you know a lot of the services I need, like you know, web hosting or DNS services or other geeky things. Uh, you know, just about all of those types of things you can buy for bitcoins, and it's it's slowly starting to move into kind of more mainstream products for for non geeks. Well, yeah, TVs and T-shirts sounds pretty mainstream from here. So uh, that's wonderful. We've been talking with Gavin Anderson. And uh, Gavin, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, I would remind people that if you want to find out more, you go to Bitcoin.org. As one of the sites mentioned, that sounds like a good place to get started if you want to find out more and learn how to get started with your own Bitcoin wallet. So Gavin, thanks a lot for your time today. No problem. Great talking to you, Chris.